Yeah. But I haven't done a webinar in a long time. Oh, you're great at it. <laughs> I was just like, well, I'll say things. That's what I'm sure of. Um, I'll just make sure I have my slides on one screen before I share my screen. Do, 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 do. And you do have a, you, yeah, the, so the chat is enabled and everything. Yeah, I'll be monitoring oh, yeah. the, the chat Q and the Q&A okay. to collect cool. questions for the event. Cool, cool. Okay, everyone, we're just going to let a few more people filter in and then we're going to get started. Yes, and I'm going to try and stick to my timing and <laughs> keep my timing kind of right, um, semi-right. Um, oh, that's fine. Neve Malrick went half an hour over one of her projected times and no one minded even a little bit. I was very sick, but uh, in my head, I'm like, but that would have been such quality. So that's okay. <laughs> I'm like, that's okay. Not Neve that would say the exact same thing about you though. That's true. She really would. Um, she really would. Um, but, 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 and um okay i think we'll get started if that's all right with you jen yep so tonight's webinar is on accessing reasonable accommodation in the university. Now that's a very big topic for people, especially with the new school year fast approaching. Yes. Yeah. We're joined tonight by Jen O'Connor, an As I Am alum who is now with <laughs> the Trinity College Disability Team. Mm -hmm. yep. And so she has a lot of experience both as an autistic person herself, who's been through much of academia. I was going to say, too much is still in academia. <laughs> Relentlessly in college. <laughs> Who also has uh, physical disabilities as well with EDS and Addison's disease. So mm -hmm. it has approached uh, disability and accommodation from a lot of angles. Yeah. And it's just a wonderful person to talk on the subject. The mm -hmm. webinar will be recorded and should be up on our YouTube channel as soon as it can be processed. We're going to be doing a Q&A at the end, so feel free to leave questions in chat or in the Q&A function, and I'll be keeping an eye on those questions and chats for the end. Do you want to get started? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. I suppose just let me know as well if at any point my like sound isn't great or anything like that. Hopefully it'll be okay, but I'm sure if someone puts it in the chat, Bridget will make me aware of it. Um, I'm going to share my screen in a sec, but just kind of like what Bridget said to echo there is that I do current, I currently work in the Trinity Disability Service as a Disability and Employment Officer. Um, but like that, I am autistic, I have ADHD, and I do have health concerns as well. Um, so for me, talking about reasonable accommodations is more or less a day a day-to-day -day kind of process for myself, but also for advocating for my students. But I think it's such a large topic because in reality, I think if you're approaching university for the first time or for the first time knowing you're autistic, for example, um, it can be really daunting to even know what's a reasonable accommodation, what kind of things you might be entitled to, what kind of sports you can get, what does a disability team even do? Um, but also, is it different to, you know, secondary school, for example, or accommodations you could receive in the workplace? So we're just going to kind of untangle and tease out those different things. Um, but I'll share my screen now and hopefully that will work. Um, so I think, Bridget, it's not letting me share. Because it's saying I'm a panelist, not a host. So can you make me host for... Sorry about that, just fixing that now. No, oh, that's all right. Make a host. There you go. Oh yeah, it's uploading here. Oh yeah, cool. Um, let me just make sure that's working. We'll go slideshow. Um, I just want to make sure I can fully see the chat and everything as well just before I start. 
Um, even though I know Bridget, you'll keep an eye on that for, for me, but I'm just going to try and keep an eye myself. Um, let's see, is this working? So can you guys let me know, or Bridget, you can let me know if you can see that, okay? Is that... Yeah, it's in the screen. It's not full screen, though. Oh, it's not full screen. Okay, one second. I'll exit out there. And I'll stop share and make it the full screen. Sorry about that. After jail. The old me who was working in as I am was doing webinars the whole time. I'd be shocked at myself. <laughs> uh, but let's see now. Mm -hmm. Is that full screen? Uh, that's full screen, but not full screen presentation. So confused. Let's see. Sorry about this. Rupert in chat says press the from beginning button. Okay, I'll see. I'd say it's coming up as, yeah, it's coming up. It'll as make it the presentation full screen. Thank you, Rupert. Perfect. Okay, we will give that a go. Mm -hmm. Has that worked? Um, it's showing your notes and all. Press the presentation mode on the right hand corner of your screen. In the right hand corner of my screen. One second, I have no idea how to do that, apologies. Let's see. Hide presenter view. There you go. That should be working. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Rupert, for the tech support and Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, guys, um, for for your patience as well. Um, I really appreciate it. But yeah, I suppose to get started, we will, I'm just going to talk through, I suppose, the structure of this, what we're going to cover. It is, like I said, quite a big topic. So we will try to cover what we can cover um, in it. And if you do have any questions or any comments you'd like to make, even if it isn't a question, you can put them in the Q&A and we'll hopefully have a decent amount of time um, to get to them. But um, I suppose just a few small um, kind of housekeeping items, what I call housekeeping is things I have to remember to say at the start of these kind of things. Um, and it's a little prompt for myself, but I am going to be talking a lot about my experiences. Um, I will mention some students' stories and things um, without naming any names or getting too specific, but I will obviously be talking about my experience. And I'm really aware that my experience as an autistic person and also someone who's chronically ill isn't every autistic adult's experience, um, not even, you know, a fraction of it, but I will just be drawing on those experiences um, and my experience of accessing accommodations as a student. And then I suppose maybe those kind of behind the scenes processes of what a disability service can do for you. Um, I am gonna be talking obviously a lot about this from an autistic perspective, that's my priority in all of this. Um, and it's potentially the priority of our discussion. But I think working with so many students has really helped me to realize autism, you know, is very, very rarely we have students, particularly in Trinity, the where we see it, where people are registered and people can register with a number of different um, conditions. Um, anyone can kind of register. You can also register as having mental health conditions if you already have also have a physical disability, whatever it might be. And we'll go into those categorizations and the reasons for them a little bit. But actually, you know, I think it's worth acknowledging that as autistic people, we're not just autistic. We're also living very busy intersectional lives that generally mean we might also have 
another disability, we might have other things that are going to impact our studies um, and looking at that. So I will probably make reference to different um, other kind of categorizations and things like that. But the supports are generally the same, but sometimes your motivation for seeking them out, I think, can be a little bit different. Um, I also just want to say I'm obviously going to be talking about this from my experience, but also my experience working in Trinity Disability Service. I didn't study and do my undergrad or my master's in Trinity, um, so that I have used other disability services in the past. We're very fortunate within Trinity that we get to connect with other, I suppose, disability services in third level across Ireland. But there is a bit of variety between what each university offers, um, and that can vary greatly. Sometimes it's small changes, um, so it's just worth, I suppose, keeping in the back of your mind when I mention something that if you are going to a particular university, um, you know, whether you're attending for the first time or anything, that it is usually worth looking at specifically what they offer, even though I think their motivations and ethos about supporting a student's academics and their full life and their happiness, realistically, is probably going to be the same. And I think once that ethos is pretty much similar, we can go from that point. So I'm just going to talk through a bit about who I am and my university experience, generally because I suppose barriers to me seeking help, um, my own ideas about what a disability service did. Also not, I guess, understanding what an accommodation is. I don't think, you know, you've done the leaving search. I was just turned 19. If you asked me to describe what a reasonable accommodation is, I had no clue. Um, and it, it, would, it wouldn't have been an intuitive way for me to talk. And I don't think it is naturally how we speak. Sometimes I have to remember that when I'm so kind of in this world of talking about disabilities or employment advice for, you know, different kind of people, all those kind of things that actually this language doesn't feel super natural a lot of the time to use and be a little bit different. Um, like in reality, what it, what does reasonable mean? So we're going to flesh that out a little bit and we can have a bit of a chat about it. Um, and I'd be really interested in your opinions, actually, as well. Um, we're going to look at types of reasonable accommodations and then also just some general advice and tips for approaching your university for support um, placement supports as well, because a lot of people will be doing different courses. And by placement, I mean, you know, you could be a nursing student, you could be someone who's going on Erasmus, you could be someone who wants to do an internship. There's lots of different things. Um, so we'll just touch on that actually as well and how, as a student, your rights and entitlements for support actually go beyond the classroom or beyond exams and into actually professional placement. Um, and then a note about disability disclosure and I suppose having that conversation as well within a university setting. So I'll uh, just zoom in on there. There we go. So I created a cool, this is such a horrendous then and now, but I think it kind of sums up pretty well, I suppose, who I am. Right now I am 29, I'm nearly 30, and I am a disability and employment officer in Trinity. I'm also a PhD student in Trinity, um, but I wasn't diagnosed as autistic or having ADHD until I was 26. Um, I didn't have a clue um, realistically about anything like that throughout my entire undergrad and my master's but what I did have going into university was quite a lot of physical health concerns that didn't have I suppose any concrete diagnosis concrete names I didn't know what was going on with my own body and also the degree at which I was able to advocate for myself was so different at 19 versus now you know um, and what I wish I knew I guess and what I wish I had been able to understand that maybe university staff are actually trained in and what they experience. Um, I started college at 19. I didn't access sports within a disability service until the end of my first year um, and a lot of that was to do with my own ideas about what supports were available, not understanding what an accommodation was but also feeling a degree of imposter syndrome around if I don't have medical documentation, if I maybe, for example, like if I was um, someone who self-identifies as autistic but doesn't have a formal diagnosis, I think I would have been really conscious that actually I don't have the medical documentation. I haven't had the assessment, so I don't I can't register. I can't get supports. Usually things aren't actually that black and white, um, but it just involves reaching out and asking for help and how to do that can be a little bit daunting. Um, so 
throughout this whole process and this whole presentation, I'm essentially going to be drawing on the, the knowledge of these two people um, and the experiences that have kind of spanned those 10 years, um, along with kind of the students I support now um, as well. For example, now I am a PhD student and a PhD is obviously very different to your undergrad. You're not necessarily sitting in classrooms the whole time. You're not sitting in lectures, but that doesn't mean you still don't need support. So actually, when I was thinking about what kind of supports I might need and like accommodations I might need, I had quite a lot I needed to consider. And this I put this up as a slide to maybe, um, I suppose, encourage you to take the time if you can, because I'm somebody that I would say that I'm quite intuitive and I can think quite clearly about my needs, but only when I have had adequate time to process them. Otherwise, it feels like the world is happening to me. And then I am just kind of moving through it and trying to cope. If I'm able to take time and one of my preferred communication methods is writing to sit down and say, what do I actually have going on? What's different for me than a neurotypical student, than someone who doesn't have chronic illness? Um, I can actually see and create this Venn diagram and see, actually, I have a lot going on. How I communicate is different and that's going to impact how I talk to lecturers. Um, the types of settings that I can study and work in are very, very nuanced and actually fluctuate. That's something that I really wanted to communicate early on as well, was actually my profile or neurotype, whatever you want to call it, of how I navigate the world in a sensory light changes depending on how stressed I am or how well I've slept the night before. I might be more light sensitive one day than another day or things like that. Um, I could be quite sensory seeking at different times, whereas other times I'm very avoidant. And being able to have that flexibility about actually I can't work in this LED lit environment all of the time is, is actually vitally important to my well-being. And then also I have a physical accessibility access of is it reasonable for me to be expected to come into campus every single day when actually there are certain points when I wake up and the pain in my joints feels like it's bursting? Um, is that reasonable? Is it necessary? And these are all conversations that can be had with lecturers, supervisors, um, I suppose different members of academic staff that you're interacting with. But I don't think it's worth, like, I don't think it'd be helpful to deny that that's a daunting, daunting process to consider. Like for me, when I was writing this up and I have my, I have a whiteboard that I love scribbling on and I was writing up these little Venn diagrams, I felt overwhelmed by all of the different aspects of me I needed to consider let alone then for me to have to take that and translate that, I guess, into something a little bit <sighs> comprehensive, something that I'm also really conscious that I want this lecturer to see me as the most competent, capable PhD student possible. I don't want to face any discrimination. I have all of these anxieties kind of humming in the background. That's where a disability service in any university is meant to step in and a disability service can come in and be helpful. What I would advise you to kind of see a disability service as is kind of like a crossroads, like a center point where you can go to them and you can, which is what I did, um, and hand this Venn diagram of you and say, this is what I'm dealing with. This is what I'm struggling with. This is what's going to impact my academic experience. They can then take that and help you communicate that to who needs to hear it. You're not on your own with this. Um, so that's just a note at the start, I guess, to kind of look at and acknowledge the complexity that we're all dealing with. Um, and that's to say as well, you know, for me in the past during my undergrad, for example, when I actually didn't, I wasn't aware of some of these Venn diagrams, but I was still having, I suppose, sensory experiences of being overwhelmed or struggling with this executive function with ADHD. Um, life because you're a student doesn't stop happening. So just because you're doing your first year or second year exams or you have a thesis due or something like that doesn't mean that you're not going to experience stress in your family, bereavement, illness, um, financial worries, whatever it might be. All of these things keep coming at you. I think I had once again this concept that actually that's something I would need to keep separate to my academics. And when I was going to the disability service and meeting a disability officer for support, I could I had to keep that to myself because that was going to be separate. But actually, once again, a disability service and I learned I'm so thankful 
with disability services, what they are there for is to sit with you and to say, what's happening for you? What's your reality right now? And yes, how is that impacting your academics? But actually, how's that impacting your wider well-being and what can be done? So I found that exceptionally helpful. Um, and that is something that we have found within Trinity as a common thread that disability services and other universities also carry forward is wishing that students knew actually you can come as a safe space to say, I don't think, I, and I turned up many times and said it, I was like, I don't think you can fix this for me. I don't think you can help. Um, but this is what's happening in my life. And actually what was really helpful was having that trauma or whatever I was dealing with communicated to a lecturer on my behalf or when I was seeking an extension for something or something like that. I think having that backup, what a disability service is, is someone to put their hand on your shoulder and kind of stand with you and say, I'm on your side here. Whatever, whatever comes, we'll figure it out. And the solution might be perfect and the solution might make it easy all of a sudden, but you're not alone in it. And that's where I'd really, really advise people to connect with their disability services uh, if they can. So I suppose just to reiterate that, barriers to support, I think, are something that disability services in general are quite aware of. Um, but for me, I did not access any services really, to be honest, for a long time um, in first year because I had this idea that actually I really should fit in. And that this should be the time of my life. I don't know if you've heard it. I don't know if your parents had said it to you, but my parents certainly said college is meant to be the best time of your life or you'll never get this time back. And those kind of statements just created such a degree of pressure in my head and my heart about what was expected of me. And I just felt so overwhelmingly like then any time point of struggle I was happening that was further confirmation actually that what, how I was navigating college and university was was wrong. There was something wrong, but the solution there wasn't to ask for help. It was to try and cope, which once again, that isn't true. And I think now I would urge people to maybe consider that it, as daunting as it is to go to your disability service and sit in front of someone and say, this is what I'm going through. Try to remember that that person across the desk very likely could have a disability themselves um but also sees thousands of students who are saying the same thing um and there's a huge willingness to help my big problem was I was I didn't have a formal diagnosis we see this quite a lot in Trinity um in Trinity disability service just to kind of give you a bit of background we have um I think we have three and a half thousand registered students with us um and each year we see quite a jump in the number of autistic students that are registered although I think the number of ADHD students is, grows a bit more rapidly every year um, but what we have found is that more and more students are registering with us but they're maybe in third year or fourth year or starting in uh, postgrad um, and we will ask them you know and they'll say oh did you not need supports during your undergrad or did you not need supports before now and they will say, oh, no, I've only gotten a formal diagnosis, even though I may be self-identified for years. Um, I would still engage with your disability service if you don't have a formal diagnosis. A lot of the time, what disability services need to be able to provide you with support isn't so much um, hugely robust medical evidence, though that is absolutely necessary at different points, but is an indication from a medical professional that you would benefit from support. So, for example, what I did um, when I didn't have a diagnosis during my undergrad, and this was less for autistic, now, things I now know are autistic traits, but for my physical health, I went to my GP and just said, I had said, I was like, I'm missing lectures, um, or I'm missing lectures all the time. My attendance feels patchy, but I'm really, I care so much about my course and what I'm doing, but I can't be there consistently. Um, I really could do with some kind of a support because I did one block of exams in a in, in massive exam hall with 800 people, um, which I'm so sure some of you have experienced. And I was so overwhelmed. I could not cope. I couldn't cope with it at all. Um, and I needed exam accommodations. And that GP was able to ask me a little bit of, um, I suppose, 
they asked me to, they, they wrote a letter and I think it was actually quite, it was quite vague, but in a quite helpful way where they said, you know, basically we would really appreciate if you could offer Jennifer some supports because she seems to be struggling with X, Y, and Z. For my medical conditions, they were able to say, these are being investigated, but right now there's nothing concrete, but the need for support is significant. When I, now working in a disability service, we get that kind of letter quite a lot, whether it's from students who think they have um, ADHD or are like maybe considering that they could be autistic or things like that, or like that maybe can't afford a formal diagnosis because that's a huge barrier, as we all know. Um, it's it's still absolutely worth connecting and trying to get support. What I would recommend doing first is re realistically is just emailing your disability service and saying, um, for example, I think I'm autistic or I'm self-identified as autistic for years, but I don't have a formal diagnosis. However, I really could do with supports around exams or course accommodations, whatever it might be, um, and see what they say. Um, but usually they will these we want we want to support people where we can where possible um and there are limitations but it's definitely worth reaching out and trying I also didn't reach out because I had no idea what supports were available I think I had a concept that it was very like secondary school of potentially only useful if you needed a scribe for an exam or the use of a computer or I don't think I realized all of the different ways that it can be really really helpful um just not even on an exam level but on an attending a lecture kind of level finding a room looking at accessibility um accessing things on blackboard or canvas or whatever it might be i think i don't even know if moodle is even a thing anymore but any of those kind of um virtual learning networks and things that different universities use so that's what we're going to explore, I suppose, now. It's just looking at different accommodations. What is an accommodation? Um, and some of the language used around accommodation and kind of why, I guess, that can just be helpful to know for yourself. In terms of reasonable accommodations, reasonable accommodations as a phrase um, is something that feels still feels a little bit alien to me because I don't think it is a natural phraseology, um, potentially, or it, or it just doesn't ever sound natural to me. However, legality wise I can see why it is used it's language that is related to the disability act um and what it is to do with is I suppose reasonable accommodations is not just used in university or education settings it's also used in the workplace and for now it's kind of the most comprehensive legislative language we have but essentially accommodations um refers to any change that needs to be made to your environment to in this case an assessment process for example um to your learning journey um that needs to be made for you to be able to have an equitable as opposed to an equal um education experience that's something that we kind of hear quite a lot as student service staff is a lot of different lectures if we you know talk to a student and potentially that student has um difficulty sitting an exam maybe an mcq or multiple choice question kind of exam in a large hall and maybe they need additional time it might just be an extra 10 minutes an hour just to process the questions sometimes we can hear from lecturers and they don't particularly mean anything negative by this but they will say oh but is that fair to every other student um you know and what we have to explain to them is actually they're getting caught up in the idea of equality whereas we are trying and this is the ethos that disability services generally have across universities is equity is what matters um you know and equity I think it's it's no different to I suppose when I look back at myself as a child and I think about my different autistic traits and how they were when I was starting school um it would have been an equal experience I would have if I had been in a mainstream classroom as I as I was you know with everyone else but actually, if I'd been diagnosed at the time, I think it would have been an equitable experience for me to experience some time with extra support, maybe in an autism class. And that would have helped me have an entirely probably more flourishing early education experience. And yes, it would have been different to everyone else or to everyone who's not autistic, but it would have been taking the uniqueness of my experience into account. That's where reasonable accommodations, as much as of a kind of stiff 
term it can be, that's kind of, that is what a reasonable accommodation means, is what's an accommodation and a change, an adjustment that can be made that is unique to this person. Reasonable is in there simply because it is, um, I suppose, more legal language in, in relation to um, typically the workplace in terms of what changes can be made um, in terms of environment, in terms of communication, in terms of academics, where this kind of really comes in and the idea of reasonable comes in is mainly looking to do with assessments. Um, and sometimes, you know, you can have a student that might need, um, they might find actually just sitting for exams for really long periods of time is actually just not conducive to their study experience. And actually they need an alternative form of assessment. Once there's a reasonable understanding of why that is, and if that's a disability related need, an autism related need, whatever it might be, then that can be put in place. So that's where that idea of reasonable come in, comes in. I think it does immediately sound a little bit hostile though, because it almost can feel like you have to justify, I guess, that your need is reasonable. Um, but there's you there's generally legal reasons for the language being the way it is. So I suppose in terms of categorization, so I'm going to go into the types of accommodations that you can look for um, and just give you some examples and things in a minute. But just kind of before we go into that, um, I obviously am speaking from a Trinity perspective, but most third level universities, there is some degree of categorization around someone's um, disability registration when you register with the disability service. I know, for example, when I received that letter from the GP that was kind of had to be purposely vague because I didn't have a diagnosis, they put me under significant ongoing illness um, because it was an ongoing issue and was likely going to be some kind of illness, but they weren't sure. But I did, and I remember asking at the time why I had to be categorized. It's generally purely about a funding concern um, and just a, making sure that actually the number of students that are receiving supports for a particular situation, whether it might be something very specific or whether it's, um, you know, something like mine where I wasn't diagnosed, that actually the funding is coming from the right stream it's really not a concern for the student to be too worried about. Um, generally, these are categorizations that we don't um, share with different with lecturers when they ask questions or things like that, because we don't think it's very beneficial for someone to have to almost declare, I guess, actually, here's the categories that my disabilities fit into. Um, instead, we like to present lectures with actually a list of accommodations to be made and saying, please do these accommodations, that's it, that they don't need actually your medical evidence. They don't get any additional information that you as a student don't choose with your own autonomy to share. Um, but just to let you know, I suppose out of interest that in the back end of things, there is a categorization happening. Um, I don't know how other universities do it. We have actually broken down neurodiversity into kind of, um, I suppose, more specific categories if you want to say which isn't the most sensitive phrasing um but neurodiversity is just simply too broad um which I'm, I'm glad we're acknowledging and kind of having you know autism adhd all of you know whether it's Tourette syndrome things like that broken down um but there is that kind of categorization happening however you can be categorized as having more than one like for me i'd be down as being autistic and having adhd but also a significant ongoing illness but then I have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, so my <laughs> joints are hypermobile and painful. That can be considered um, a physical disability, depending on categorization. Um, but it might just be worth noting that if you do speak to your disability service and the very first time you talk to them and, you know, you're trying to explain your different needs. It can be jarring if someone does say to you, ask for, you know, specific medical information or things like that usually that's for a note around categorization that actually doesn't impact the supports you receive it's just about funding so I would try not to be too daunted or put off by that um if that does come up um although I do think most disability officers are really happy to explain that because none of us like I suppose talking through that specific categorization what we do with our students in Trinity is we allow our students to categorize themselves when they register um and decide for themselves and then we don't ed edit that because for example we have a lot of students that are autistic and they register for supports 
but what they actually really need supports for is their anxiety. So they might actually register as anxiety as a primary concern that they really want to address. And for us, and my opinion personally, is that that isn't something for us to challenge. That's something for us to respect. So that's just a side note. So in terms of the types of reasonable accommodations that you can receive, um, we have exam accommodations, course accommodations and additional supports. Um, exam accommodations typically refer to those kind of big end of semester exams, I guess, um, kind of the big, the bigger ones. Course accommodations means any kind of adjustment um, or support that helps you attend your lectures, um, experience the class with a degree of quality, you know, being able to take in the information. We hear a lot from students and I know it was my experience that on days when I was really overwhelmed, I would be present physically in the class, but I couldn't engage in the class. I I was there simply so that my attendance didn't drop, to be honest. Um, a course accommodation would have been really handy there to be able to talk about flexibility on attendance, for example, and things. Um, additional supports are unique to each kind of disability service, depending on your university. Um, and there are additional things that might be, um, for example, the disability service in Trinity has a few different occupational therapists to help people balance, I suppose, their, to look at someone as a whole person as opposed to their student life only, um, but to look at, you know, how are you balancing your social life and your well-being and the other things you want to do, which might be playing sport or visiting your family or things like that. Um, additional supports can also be things like quiet spaces on campus, access to lockers as well, um, assistive technology too. Um, so we'll touch on a few of these, um, I guess. But in terms of exam accommodations, I think that's the big one that really um, it's definitely my was my primary motivator for finally going into the disability service and having that chat that I was so dreading um, was that I did sit that exam in that massive hall. I panicked. I remember my hands shaking. I couldn't. And it was like I could feel everyone around me breathing as one. And that was so overwhelming. Um, so for me, I knew I couldn't do another semester, end of semester exams like that. Um, I didn't know what was available to me. If, for example, you did have exam accommodations in secondary school, they can be quite different in college. Um, they The accommodation you receive can be the same, but sometimes there might be a difference on timing. The types of venues are usually a little bit different. Um, right now, different universities in Ireland are trying to come together to make sure that there is, I suppose, a uniformity around things. So that, for example, if you were offered 20 minutes extra in Trinity, you would be also offered that if you went to UL. Um, and that it's kind of, there is that kind of more understanding um, about that. But that is taking quite a lot of consultation with the disability community and won't happen too quickly. So it is worth talking to your disability service about specifics. Um, if you did have accommodations for your exams when you did the leaving cert, for example, it's, it's always worth mentioning that um, and maybe giving someone an idea of what was helpful for you they might not be the exact same. So for example, additional time in universities can change depending on your need um, and is usually applied as a per hour exam accommodation. Um, for example, in Trinity, we have 10 minutes extra, 15 minutes, 20 minutes and 30 minutes, depending on you know, your, your need or what's reasonable for you, what's worked in the past, um, things like that. Usually that's kind of the ballpark figure. Um, generally, a lot of different autistic students, I know I I think I received an extra 10 minutes per hour. Um, and I, it wasn't that I couldn't get the exam done on time, but it was that I needed almost that 10 minutes buffer time to feel as though I was panicked um, and to process. And when you first sit down in your seat to ground yourself, whereas I found that exceptionally hard to do when I otherwise just felt like I need to really launch into this exam straight away. And that just created, I suppose, this constant roller coaster of anxiety. Different exam venue types are, these are usually more much more nuanced than secondary school. I think in secondary school, though my understanding of that isn't fully clear, obviously, um, wouldn't be where I'm most knowledgeable, but I think in secondary school, there can be a lot more of individual venues where someone does an exam on their own. Potentially, it's just them and a marker um, and maybe they needed, you know, movement breaks or they needed a scribe. They needed um, use of assistant te assistive technology. Universities are much more nuanced in the sense of having different venues that are 
um, individual venues, computer venues, which is generally about maybe eight people um, who need to use computers. Um, there is also in Trinity, we have low distraction venues as well. That's usually about 10 to 15 people. And those are environments that are specifically set up to be, um, I suppose, low distraction in terms of like sensory stimulus um, and also to have, um, I suppose, barriers between you and the person next to you, for example, and helping you focus. A lot of people would use noise cancelling headphones or I suppose non-electronic ones. So it'd be just your defenders. Um, we also do have a group venue, which is actually where I think most of our autistic students benefit from is avoiding those large venues with like 800 to 1000 people. A group venue is about 50 people. It's much calmer, much quieter, and generally everyone has the same amount of extra time. So everyone is leaving at the same time, starting at the same time. The disruptions are relatively minimal. Um, no exam venue is perfect, but I think it is worth talking about and knowing the different types that are available to you um, when you speak to a dis the disability service for the first time and looking at what you need. Um, I would also say it can be a real tendency, I think, to feel I think when I was when I was first offered a computer venue because my um, because of my joints some pain in my hands which I didn't have a reason for at the time I immediately said no to that because I thought I was like somebody else needs it more and I thought well no I'll be fine even though actually I find gripping pens for a long amount of time I would I would have to soak my hand in magnesium salts for an hour or two every evening um, but I was still fine. Um, it can be really difficult, I think, and we see it a lot when students come in and we are readily available to help and we can say, how about extra time? I think when you have gone through life, potentially specifically for autistic people, this is extra hard and you really, really felt alienated. When someone's offering you help, it can be really quick to say, no, I'm fine, I'll just cope. I would say just take a moment to pause and think, actually, I would really benefit from this maybe. Um, or me getting this kind of support doesn't take it away from somebody else and that's something I try to always kind of remind people and hopefully make people a little bit aware of um in terms of specific technology as well for exams this just means things like like a, a laptop or computer or for example some people use different kinds of writing um equipment typically this is just worth talking to your disability officer about in terms of assistive technology um and obviously we have things like scribes as well. In terms of course accommodations, um, what I think can be your experience of attending your course is, is so much more fluctuating than your exams, because I suppose everyone is prepping for those final semester exams, but actually day to day turning up is what's difficult um, and not just turning up, but accessing the materials. So these kind of accommodations can include things, for example, when it comes to accessing materials like um, I receive the permission to record my lectures or my lectures, even though even when I was present, because sometimes my hand wouldn't necessarily work to take notes um, or I would feel kind of cognitively really foggy and things like that. Um, so having the ability to record was really, really helpful. Um, you can also maybe get access to recordings of lectures in advance, PowerPoints in advance. Um, if you have a continued absence for maybe there's a medical appointment that you absolutely have to make um, and you can't, you can't miss it, but it means you're missing the one lecture every week. Generally, a disability service can then advocate for you to get access to those notes. Um, so you're not having to do that battle again. It's all about making that conversation with the lecturer easier. Um, I will say, I personally find that 90% of lectures, they just want to help, but they really just need to be communicated with, with how to do that and how to do that effectively. Um, it's worth noting as well that if you do receive exam accommodations for those end of semester exams, you are entitled to those accommodations for your in-class assessments if, for, if your course does them. I think maybe since COVID, they're a little bit less um, and they aren't, they aren't as frequent, but it is, it is worth noting that you are entitled to those accommodations as well. Um, so those kind of things, like what, what they also mean in terms of absence can simply be, I think it can be really difficult if you are struggling with your attendance or submitting assignments on time regularly because of a consistent issue, whether it is your mental health, whether it is, for example, you go through a 
depressive period or things like that, this is where the disability service is the one that you can go to and say, I don't know how to communicate this to my lecturers, but I am struggling. Can we communicate them this to them? And um, what I do a lot of the time, and it's only with, we only ever do this with the student's permission, is we communicate with those lectures, we state as much information as the student is comfortable with and no more, um, and usually CC the student into it so they're aware the communication has happened, but it takes, I think, the pressure off the student to feel like they had to put it all out there and explain everything and explain what they're going through. Um, and generally, they do receive significant understanding in return. Additional supports. These can be uh, very varied, but I suppose the two to, that are worth noting um, is academic planning is generally available in some version in most universities, whether it's academic support or academic writing centers or things like that. But if you are struggling with managing your timetable, but also, I suppose, feeling like you're maybe in like week eight of semester one and all of the assignments are suddenly due at the same time, having someone to sit down with you and break down tasks, because I know for me, I see things in a really big monolith kind of way. And I, yeah, I just see everything in a very big picture ways all the time that having someone to say, well, actually, what's a bite sized chunk of that? If I was to do that by myself, I don't think I could do that effectively. But talking to someone else about it is really helpful. Um, disability services can also connect you with other services as well. I was mainly encouraged to go to the disability service after I actually went to the GP. I got that letter um, and they said, well, actually, maybe you could talk to the disability service and they could talk to you a little bit more about student counselling and accessing student counselling. Um, even though I didn't need to go through the disability service to do that, these services are quite connected and there's a lot of overlap and it can be really nice to feel like you're scaffolded. That's kind of what I hear from a lot of our students and what I felt is it feels like you've got a team in a few different places around campus, whether that is student counselling, college health centres, um, the disability service, that there's more than just your academics happening, that actually there is support there. And sometimes if you look at dis the disability services at that crossroad point, it can just be helpful to be pointed in the right direction or to be given a referral letter, for example, to student counselling, if you once again don't know if you have the emotional bandwidth for whatever reason on that day to go into the counselling service and explain this is what I'm struggling with. It can be really handy to have someone who, kn who knows you to say, here's a letter. This will help give them some context and help you out. So this is something I suppose, which is what I meant there is the idea of when you're sitting down to consider the different kind of supports you might need, um, look at yourself as a whole person, not just a student. Consider your whole academic experience, but also your whole campus experience. I know not every university has a kind of set campus, but think about how you use libraries. Do you need additional support with that? Is there, um, for example, you're socializing and attending clubs and societies. Would you like to go to the gym? But is that really stressful? Um, you could really do with someone proofreading your essays. These are the kind of things that a disability service mightn't be able to individually help you with themselves, but can point you in the right direction. But don't feel as though you need to just come in and say, I have my dissertation due and I'm really struggling with it. And this is the word count. And you can only talk about your academics. Actually, we're really interested in you as a whole person and your whole college experience being quality, um, not just that your degree that you come out with is a degree that you're happy with, but actually the experience is something you can look back at and say was empowering rather than a series of challenges that you just had to overcome. And because I think life can feel like that anyway, to be honest. Um, so it's it's just important to look at that. So just to, I suppose, coming towards the end here, um, just to look at some general advice and tips. These are just things that come up repeatedly that I think can be helpful. Um, so just to mention again, Bear in mind that a diagnosis and medical evidence might not be strictly necessary always. It's always worth asking the question. Um, I would just say, bear in mind these people who work in disability service, they really do this. And I know I'm biased because I'm, I'm talking about my colleagues specifically and I don't know everyone, but... Um, oh, excuse me. <laughs> but um, these people really want to help you. They absolutely do. So if they can, they're going to. 
Also bear in mind, you are entitled to ask questions. You're entitled to ask for clarifications. If you do see that you've been categorized under one category of disability, for example, and that doesn't feel accurate for you, or um, you want oversight of what your disability officer is doing, or you, you want to be CC'd in something, that's more than reasonable. That is your entitlement and your right. Um, and that no one should question that. So feel free to ask those questions. Remember, this is your college experience. This is, we are student services. We're here to serve students um, and to empower them. It's also worth noting if you are coming from secondary school that the relationship that you have with your lecturers is very different to your secondary school teachers. Um, it should be, and I think it's, <laughs> I think it's better. That's just my personal experience because I think in college, when you bed into it and you are used to it a little bit, you do have more autonomy over your life and your agency and who knows what about you, for example, um, because your different lecturers are likely working in very large academic schools and they're, they're very probably not talking um, and communicating regularly and they generally don't talk about students and their additional needs. So you have much more ownership over your narrative around things. I think that can be really freeing. It can be really scary at the start though, when you're not sure how to ask for support and communicate the support you need. If you're used to a secondary school environment where maybe that communication was done automatically for you and potentially without you. Um, so just give yourself a bit of grace, I think to understand and adjust to that change and transition period, because that can be difficult. Um, I would say, I say this personally, because this is what I do. I do this when I go to the doctor. I do this when I go anywhere is it's totally okay to come to a meeting with your um, disability officer or potentially college health, whoever it is you want, you're seeing with notes in advance or being having stuff written down that you want to talk about. Or um, I have one student, for example, that communicates um, through, she will, she'll make voice recordings of what she wants to talk about beforehand because she can be overwhelmed in the moment, which I fully understand. So she'll play them for me. And then once I've had a chance to listen to them, I can say, oh, OK, I get it. Um, and we can use that as a starting point. But because she's had that time to process in advance, it's been really, really helpful. Um, so I think that's that can be really, really helpful. I wouldn't worry about feeling like you will be perceived of as strange or different or all of those horrendous words that us as autistic people just are battered with and kind of absorb like sponges um, from the world around us because the services themselves and like the staff there we are so used to people who communicate in a thousand different ways and who prefer um communicating you know without eye contact or prefer low lit rooms or i have students that i meet and we actually um for regular meetings and we meet and we go for walks because it's nice for both of us to be honest to not have the pressure of constant eye contact um and it gives us kind of something to focus on as we're going to do our walk around campus um, and it helps us work through topics and things. There's a lot of different ways to do that. Staff are just generally very open to those kind of suggestions. But if you do want to come to a meeting in advance with notes, whatever way that might be, um, I have another student who communicates through graphic design and drawings and things, and she creates like mock posters around her experiences. I find that so fantastic. Um, and like that, it takes the pressure off that ne necessary verbal communication of sitting across a desk from each other and me saying, well, how can I help you? What do you want me to do? You know, that just creates pressure, to be honest. Um, it's worth noting as well, it's kind of similar to that point about secondary school. Parents are generally less involved because once you are over the age of 18 and once you are the university student, it's not just a GDPR thing around your privacy, but it's also a case of disability services trying to develop the ethos much more firmly around respecting um, any student's autonomy to their own narrative around their disability, the information they might share with their disability officer, all of those things. So if you do want your parent to be involved, for example, maybe in that first meeting or we have a few students that we meet online and actually because of what they're struggling with, they really could do with an extra person there to help absorb information. Um, and with their permission, their parents join the call or, or their sister or whoever it might be. But we will kind of constantly be seeking your permission for that because it's not as automatic as secondary school where it's assumed the entire family is involved. Instead, it's 
the student is the center of this and we're going to go from their voice out. That's how it should be and that's how you should feel. It should be your voice, voice first. Um, I would recommend in terms of your disability service to try and meet them early in the academic year if you can. Generally disability services, even if you sign up, I'm a testament to this, I signed up so late, they will accommodate you 100%, but it can be really nice to have that processing time, not to mention just having the supports from the start, but that's in an ideal world. If it takes you a little bit longer to process going in or even to figure out where the bloody building is or any of that kind of stuff, be patient with yourself. Um, I also found it really, really helpful when I was meeting. I, I remember really connecting with the first person I met in the disability service I went to and I found their communication style really suited mine. There was just no pressure. Um, I was automatically offered to the option to continue meeting that person. We have that level of continuity in Trinity as well. So if you do find that the staff member you are being offered to meet the next time is different, feel free to advocate for yourself and say, actually, I think I was talking to Jen last time. I could really do with seeing someone, you know, who, who already knows me or um, knows my story, whatever it might be. You don't have to justify it. That's a perfectly reasonable request. Um, and just a final note on universities in general, to be honest, is universities are massive organizations and, and they're just not cohesive places. And I think that's entirely fair to say because there's so many different schools, there's so many different services. So it can be worth knowing that, for example, if you have had, um, if you're connected with a doctor in college health, for example, that the disability service doesn't automatically know that, or that the supports you receive, for example, from one lecturer, um, and they, they are so supportive and really aware of what you need and they need less explanation, but the next lecture really needs a bit more, they probably have never spoken and don't work in the same building. It's it's really been something that has been helpful for me to learn as a PhD student is actually just how separate everyone is and how little information a lot of people are working on because otherwise it can feel like people are purposely not taking into account your, your needs, like your autistic needs, whatever it might be, or that you are explaining yourself quite a few times, but actually realizing that's not actually happening because anyone's frustrated or anything like that or not doing their job it's actually just a communication concern in a large environment and that's just worth knowing just a note on placement supports if you are someone who is going to be doing you know you could be doing primary teaching um, and you're going out to schools whatever it might be the supports can be really really similar to what you receive when you're on campus um, but they can be a little bit more different and nuanced just things to consider that you might need like for example making placement staff aware that you have a disability, that you are autistic, whatever it might be. Um, or on the flip side, making a note that you're like, I actually would really like if the head of the nursing ward that I'm, I'm gonna be on for the next six weeks does not know that I'm autistic. That's entirely your right as well. Um, and that that's entirely fair. Most people um, and most disability services will require you to have an extra meeting before you begin placement to just sit down and chat about placement specific things. And they probably will throw up different suggestions and say, could you do with additional time to note take? Or for example, in nursing and uh, medicine, could you do with a bit more time to um, in between patients? Um, we have a lot of dentistry students, for example, who need additional time when completing practical tasks and exams and things. Um, maybe due to fine motor skills, whatever the reason might be, we don't offer explanations. We don't say this student needs extra time note taking because here's their medical evidence of what they have going on for them. What's their experience? That's not required legally. A person doesn't need to know that. What they need to know is that what you've agreed with the disability service for you to have that equitable experience is the are these things. One that I really like, for example, um, is and that I would benefit from with when I was thinking about Erasmus was the idea of having more regular feedback um, from a supervisor, for example, um, mainly because I tend to internalize my entire life and tend to, tend to think that actually if someone doesn't tell me I'm doing well, then I must be doing terribly. Um, and I've kind of gotten past the point of thinking I'll get over that. I think that might just be my brain. But if I was able to have more regular feedback sessions and chats with a supervisor to sit down, even if it's just an extra 10 minutes a week, that maybe other people don't need to get that confirmation of how am I doing? Is there anything I need to be aware of? 
oh, okay, there's not. Great, I'm doing fine. Great. It's just that verbal nod, really, and saying, yep, yeah, that's fine. Sensory adaptations like that. We have a lot of people who wear um, noise cancelling headphones who have permission to maybe leave placement to go on movement breaks, to wear certain types of glasses. All of those things, some things you might think of, you know, like wearing tinted glasses, for example, if you are light sensitive. Um, you don't need to do a needs assessment or a chat with a disability service to do that. You can do that. Sometimes, though, we have a lot of students that find that actually having it be explained on a document to the head of the placement, wherever that might be, they feel like that takes a bit of the pressure off of them, I think, um, and the pressure off of like this kind of question in the background of when you can see someone looking at you thinking, why are they doing that? Why are they wearing those? Um, and that kind of thing. So maybe just have a have a think for yourself about what would make you feel not just you know supported in a sense of your disability but also comfortable um and just also th the next one i suppose is just access to medical appointments we have a lot of students who need to go to therapy for example at the same time every week um things like that a disability service will advocate on your behalf and say there's a regular medical appointment once again they don't need any information about what that appointment is for it's none of their information so no one's business um but that these are the times the student will be missing can we come up with an alternative way for that student to make up that placement hours if for example it's something you know something I have to do um but these are the kind of things just to consider but once again if you do agree to meet with the disability service in your university generally they'll go through all these bits with you and they will go through them in a paced way so it won't feel super overwhelming it'll just be as they come up um final note um before I finish up um I suppose is the idea of around disability disclosure Generally, obviously, when you decide to register for a disability service, you have declared a disability to some degree. Um, you might have declared, you know, and said, I'm autistic um, or whatever it might be. Usually there's a space for people to describe how their college is impacted by this. Um, that's usually just to give a disability officer before they meet you a bit of an overview of, OK, I think in my head, I think we'll probably look, need to look at exam accommodations or things like that. It's just kind of, I suppose, pad that conversation in case someone comes in, they're overwhelmed and maybe doesn't want to have to start from scratch. But that doesn't mean that your lecturers automatically have a right to your information about your diagnosis, um, what supports you access, all of these things. Obviously, to be able to get exam accommodations, the exam team has to know, for example, um, but if you choose at any point to say, actually, I don't, I would prefer if um, it wasn't stated to a lecturer what my diagnosis is, but just to tell them the exam accommodations I need or to tell them that I need to record the lectures, but I don't want them to have my medical information. That is your right and your choice. And that's also the baseline that disability officers will agree on. We operate at such at the highest level of privacy first, I guess, is the idea. And then if someone, a student says, oh, I don't mind if they know or this kind of thing, with that student's permission, we might share that information. And if it's necessary, we'll share that information. But it's also OK if you don't feel comfortable in that. Um, and I don't think that may, means that you're ashamed of who you are or that you are, you know, less autistic or anything like that. I know so many students that actually they feel that it's just not the right time for them to share that or that they're happy with their disability officer knowing the details of their life, but they don't want their placement coordinator to know. I think that's entirely fine and not reflective of how you might feel about autism or about disability in general. And is actually just you listening to how you feel internally. And that's OK. You don't you shouldn't have to explain that usually to a disability officer, to be honest, because we will generally really understand um, if you say, can you keep that information to yourself? Or I would just rather if that information was staying between us, that's entirely fine. Um, so yeah, that is, um, I suppose, finishing up. Um, so that is my email, just in case anyone has any questions I want to follow up with. I know you can follow up with um, Bridget as well. Um, but I might sh stop sharing my screen there. If I can just get it. Here we go. Um, so here we go. 
Um, but thank you guys for listening to me. And I'm sorry I went over time, but I also tech can't cope with technology and messed up the time of the yeah, start yeah. anyway. <laughs> you got your extra time. That's true. I had my extra time per hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So among the compliments, we did get some questions. Oh yeah, absolutely. So one thing that came in mm -hmm. and I know speaks to my experience is that back when I did this, which wasn't terribly long ago. Yeah, I like we're, we're young and fresh, Bridget. We're young and fresh. <laughs> um, I was met with, and the person who sent in this question was met with needing to have the documentation, needing to know in advance yeah. what support you need. Mm. Is yeah. that something that's changed quite a lot in the past mm. few years? Or is that something... Like, is Trinity the outlier here? Um, the situation there? I will say Trinity is a little bit... I'm, I'm hesitant to say a front runner because that sounds wildly biased. <laughs> um, but I know it's something that we put a lot of funding into is making communication, making things available. Like one of the projects that I'm working on at the moment, for example, is making a roadmap of a needs assessment so someone knows exactly what that looks like before they attend down to like what the room looks like and things like that but also so that someone can see every possible accommodation broken out that they know um beforehand that being said there is has been quite an ethos change generally for the onus not to be on the student to know exactly um what needs to be there what I would say to do is if you do feel like you are being met with oh god I'm going to go in and they're going to say how can I help you and just stare at me um I would tend to email in advance and ask for what kind of accommodations they offer. Generally, most universities in Ireland have pretty comprehensive documentation about that, but they're just buried in websites or they're they're just they're hard to find. So just you can always email and say you want to prepare for the meeting and you'd like to have an idea about this. Could you send me some breakdowns um, and look at that? Generally, if the disability officer is, uh, you know, honestly, probably loves their job, they're more than happy to sit down with you and say, this is the kind of options, this is what's available, this is how it looks um, as well. But it is it is definitely changing so that the onus isn't on the person to immediately come in ready to communicate. And that's coming from an acknowledgement, um, I guess, and more students, student activism about the idea of just different communication styles and that we can't expect someone to have all the information straight away. But I would send that pre-email um, and say that you can say in that this will help me prepare so I have more information and they can send that on to you um, as well but yeah that is probably what I would say it's still not an ideal world so are these kinds of accommodations also offered in continuing education are these mm -hmm um the they distance post-secondary yeah there is they are I suppose coming in more but there's not a level of uniformity just yet as far as I'm aware in the likes of an ETB or things like that um they're sh and they're generally also I suppose because the staffing is quite different um can be I suppose we're lucky you know in a disability service you have disability specific staff or like different um departments will have a disability liaison officer in colleges of further education there's just generally less staff um so the accommodations might not be as robust they might not have systems in place for putting them in place but that doesn't mean you're not entitled to that equitable experience legally um you absolutely are so what i would say is once again, maybe have, try to have a pre-meeting and discussion about what's actually available. Um, those kind of further education and the ETB, for example, I, I think what we have heard a lot is, and I, I might be wrong, is that they find it really helpful when people come to them and say, this is what I had help with in secondary school, or this is what I found useful in secondary school, or this didn't work for me. So it might just be that it requires a little bit more um, fleshing out but generally, you are you are still entitled to that degree of support. So, uh, is there a working definition of what reasonable hmm. means? 
I would say ahead that I did want to have this be titled how to get like accommodations yes third yeah. level but yeah. our, our wonderful um, <laughs> um, our wonderful communications manager Rosemary told me that that might make people think that we're helping with housing and well, well, we don't know like, no which I mean which to be fair sometimes we do help with in disability services but mm. it, it is always different um, the reason I included reasonable accommodations is because it's the legal term used. I can okay. understand, um, I can understand why reasonable sounds vague, but what people have to understand, I guess, is that when you come in for a needs assessment and you're initially even chatting about what you might need, it's actually quite a robust process. Um, and it's usually not just a disability officer involved. Um, and these are processes because it's public sector as well that are absolutely constantly audited um so for example if i was to come i was meeting with a student and um most universities in ireland now have a very student-led approach where we're looking at a strengths-based approach but also acknowledging what a student might need so if i agree with a student and say you need uh, it sounds like you need 20 minutes extra per hour and use of a computer or something like that for your exams if they agree with that um and they decide that um, and they agree with me and we sign off on it. That also will generally, um, with the student's permission, be sent to a disability liaison officer in their school. They will review that. Um, if we do find that there is any kind of rejection of an accommodation that a student needs, and this is where I would ask people to remember that as a disability service, like we're on the side of the student till the end, you know, we're, we're always with the student. Um, and what they need, because I suppose we're talking to students all the time and we're hearing actually what the actual struggle is. But if there is actually a resistance within an academic department to put that into practice, um, there is processes to go through to challenge that. And generally, they're very robust processes where you are supported by multiple staff members within the disability service, which can sometimes be um the director of services can sometimes be social workers can be involved, things like that, to make sure that your voice is being heard. Um, I understand that it can sound as though what's reasonable and what isn't is hard to say. What I would say is disability services and particularly Trinity, I know it's it's our thing is when we come to a definition of reasonable, we are guided by the student student's experience of what is reasonable for them, not what is reasonable for every autistic person. Or I had an autistic student last week and they didn't need this thing, you know, that you do. Um, but actually you are telling me you do. And it sounds like you'd really benefit from that. So that's reasonable because you have advocated for that. And I'm going to trust that this helps you have that experience. And then if you receive any kind of backlash to that or challenge academically, there's processes for making sure that is remedied. There are obviously not pleasant processes to have to do, which is why we try to focus on educating academic staff so that they don't challenge things. And it does happen rarely. It's not it's not a common experience. Um, but generally, I would remember that the disability service staff are on the side of the student from the off, to be honest. It's still not a perfect phraseology, though, to be fair. Is there any sort of list of like what common accommodations are, what mm -hmm. the general offer is? Like they'll always be bespoke things, but yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, I can send you, Bridget, like our the Trinity breakdown of mm -hmm. of different accommodations and kind of what goes into them. And like just to talk people through in case anyone's interested, I know I'm keeping people over time is um what happens I guess is in a, a if you come in and you it's the very first time you're meeting with a disability officer you do what's called a needs assessment that's generally like 40 minutes to an hour and it sounds very intense but it is helping the disability officer get to know you but also making sure that you're comfortable saying all the different ways that you think you might need help in that moment and then we usually come in and make some suggestions what's put together then is a document there's different names for this document depending on where what university you're in in trinity it's called learning education needs summary a lens um which sounds like a big deal but it's actually a digital document that's broken into bullet points of what we agreed that you needed and the idea is that this is a really easy way for us to communicate your need to a lecturer 
and they can just quickly see the bullet points of what you need. Your medical information isn't on that. Um, what you put, um, I suppose, in your, what you decided to dis disclose when you were registering, all of that kind of thing, um, all, of, all of that kind of information isn't in it. It's just what we agreed. And then that gets released with the student's approval only um, to the school um, for them to decide um, not if they will put them in place because they have to put them in place at that point once they're agreed, but for the school to actually put those things in place. I can send you that list, Bridget. I don't yeah, know. I'll to... put that in an email to the registers. Yeah, because so. I'll pull it up because I I, I know we have an accessible version, one that's more digital accessible for readers and things. So I'll mm -hmm. find the PDF and the link um, and I'll get that to you. Yeah, okay. I'll send that out with the recording to everyone. Cool. 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 Um, I know someone asked something in the chat um, a, a little bit ago. I don't know where it was. Um, I don't know if someone mentioned earlier if I saw something, but if you are someone who is wanting to have your parent there for additional support or anything like that, mm -hmm. that's not uncommon and it's not strange. It's absolutely fine, but it will always be, you'll probably get a little bit tired if you are the student of the disability service saying, are you comfortable with this? Is this okay? And if once you are, that's absolutely fine. Mm -hmm. Um, We have parents that come in, we have students, we have partners that come in for us it's once there's confirmation but if we do for, do any follow-up communication we only do that with the student generally and if they decide to share the email with their parent or things like that that's fine but generally that's kind of where the line is um unless they have expressly said and actually email my mom i'm getting really overwhelmed by this or something that's absolutely fine and there's no no shame in that at all to be honest um it is it is very helpful um, and I know someone said in the chat that the best way can be to talk to the lecturer direct directly absolutely absolutely um, which is something that our students do quite frequently where we have students who will come to us for exam accommodations but then they maybe um, find themselves in need of like an extension you know or something coming up to the end and they we can help them have this conversation but a lot of the time they're absolutely fine to do that themselves uh, because they've gotten to know the lecturer so that's something I wouldn't underestimate is actually you'll probably get to know these lectures in like quite positive ways and have lovely relationships with them. And sometimes it can just be easier to chat to them. It's just if you are at a point in your life, you're overwhelmed, something stressful is happening. You're feeling like your communication. For me, it feels like my communication gets kind of frayed and gets mm. very edgy. And if you ask me and it's like the one time I really need to be comprehensive is to explain why I need support. I can't do it. Um. A disability officer is going to, and I know it's something I try to do, I don't care how my students turn up in terms of communicating with me. Um, sometimes I've had students at the end of sessions when they say I've been really rude today or blunt today or whatever. I don't care. I don't care because I, because I just care about them so much. But I'm also like, I showed up in so many ways to so many settings where I didn't get any kind of consideration. Um, so if you find that actually I'm struggling with that, could do with somebody else chatting to this lecture on my behalf, chat to your disability officer. Even if you haven't spoken to them in six months, they'll be happy to hear from you. They'll be really happy to hear from you. <laughs> or else I just say that to all my students, but I mean it. So I think we all we always are happy when we hear from a student we haven't heard from in a while and we're able to touch base. So, yeah. Okay. I think that's a wrap on the questions. So I might say good night and- and um, sorry for going over time, everyone, on your I don't Tuesday think there's night. anyone at all. <laughs> <laughs> still, still... I'll send out the recording and yeah, I'll we'll... get you that list. The list sometimes yeah. tomorrow. I'll I'll send you I'll send you a good bit of information from different services and things like mm -hmm. that. And obviously I can't speak for anyone outside Trinity. Um, but it should be kind of similar anyway. And this way, at least maybe if you look at what the language that Trinity uses, it will be similar in other universities. Yeah. So you could say I can see this is an offer here on the Trinity website. Do we have an equivalent? Because a lot of the time there's an equivalent kind of thing. And it just gives you a language to talk about a thing with. Um, but thank you guys for listening to me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jen, for all of the information. I know that so many people seem to value it so much and it's only going to get more eyes okay. on it when it goes up. Well, hopefully, I mean, people feel free if anyone has any questions or anything, you can reach out via email, like mm. I'm always happy to kind of help or anything or 
um anything like that and i can i'll send you on i can send you on slides as well bridget but i don't i don't know if anyone needs them okay so okay dokes. have a nice evening everyone bye um, bye it was good to see you bridget as well it's really nice yeah. to see you <laughs> and it was nice to be back <laughs> have a nice evening and a good rest of everyone's week we'll see you guys bye